Welcome everyone to this evening's uh, Dhamma sharing. Now this I believe is uh, this speaker's first public uh, sermon, Dhamma sermon here at the Buddhist Mahavihara. Even though Bhante uh, Mahinda, Professor Mahinda has come here before, he hasn't given us an uh, opportunity, he didn't have an opportunity to have a public sermon. Uh, so this year for Vesak we decided to invite him uh, from his busy schedule in the UK to come and join us and share his knowledge. As you know, uh, he is a very uh, serious academic, right? When I read his profile, you will find out why. Pante Professor Digle Mahinda is a professorial research associate at the School of Oriental and Asian Studies at the University of London. He's also a professor emeritus at the uh, for the study of religions philosophies and ethics at the Bath Spa University in UK. He was also a visiting scholar at the Faculty of Divinity uh, at the University of Cambridge. Professor Deagley is a graduate of uh, Harvard University, the University of Chicago, the University of Peradeniya. He has held a Numata visit professorships at the Buddhist Studies at McGill University in Canada and NEH professorships in humanities at the Colgate University in the US. Uh, that's only in the western part, huh? now in the eastern part. He, he has also conducted postgraduate, uh, postdoctorate research at Kyoto University, Aichi Gaokin University, and the International College for Postgraduate Buddhist Studies in Japan, under the auspices of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, and uh, the Bukyo Dendo Koikai. I hope I got that right. That's a mouthful, huh? Already. There's a lot more, but I'm not going to read all those. <laughs> uh, Bante is a prophilic, uh, prophilic uh, writer. Okay, he's authored many books. He's got a lot of reference material online, journals. Um, he's also the former editor in chief of the Journal of the Buddhist and Christian Studies. Uh, on top of all that, he was also a media celebrity. He has appeared on BBC One, on The Big Questions, BBC World Service, uh, Al Jazeera, and Buddhist TV programs. Uh, he's conducted fieldwork in Sri Lanka, Japan, Korea, and China. His research concentrates on ethics of war and violence, minority issues, and in uh, minority issues in pluralist society, uh, religious extremism, Buddhism, and politics. Um, he's into interreligious dialogue, religious conversions, ascetism in Japan, Buddhism in the West, pilgrimage and Buddhist rituals, preaching traditions, Tripitaka translations, and palm leaf manuscript collections in South and Southeast Asia. Now we know why he's so busy. It's, <laughs> it's never ending work. <laughs> Even now, while he's in his room, he's always working. Constantly working, when he comes down for his meals. You don't see him during the daytime, you know, sitting outside and chatting with anyone. He's always working. So we are very honored, Bhante, to have you here this evening to share with us on this topic, on the Aganya Sutta. I think many of you have heard of the Sutta. And Bhante talks about beginnings, kingship, and morality. Bhante? Yeah. yeah. Th thank you very much. Namu tasse bhagavatu aratu samma sambuddhasse Namu tasse bhagavatu aratu samma sambuddhasse Namu tasse bhagavatu aratu samma sambuddhasse Dhamma savana kalu ayang badanta Dhamma savana kalu ayang badanta Dhamma savana kalu ayang badanta We have a venerable member here dear friends in Dhamma first of all I must thanks to Mr Leslie Jawardana because this would not have been possible without his initiation. Uh, right after I left last year in September, he got 
to me, got got back to me and said that, oh, you must come and, and book, reserve the flight. And so it was perhaps the, the flight I have ever booked in advance, so advanced, several months ago. So thank you very much for inviting me and accommodating me. And my uh, stay here last year has been very fruitful. And also this year, thank you very much for generosity of the uh, Sahasana Abhivardhan Society and its members and the place. I'm very much appreciated. Now, today's topic, I'm going to talk about uh, Agganya Sutta. The topic is obvious. And I kind of title it as the beginnings uh, kinship and morality. And now uh, I like to have in the form of discussion, but because of the content I may be uh, not be able to do it fully. However, if you, while I'm talking, if you have a problem, you can raise the hands and we can stop and go slowly. And now uh, the, the lecture series is titled as Buddhist Social and Political Philosophy. So these three lectures today and next two, uh, two Sundays, they are kind of related. So if I don't do everything today, we can pick them up uh, next week when we do it. And, and now uh, this sutta, Agganya Sutta, it's, it's um, I mean, the, it will be clear when we get into it, but uh, it, it, it has very interesting aspects, and that's why I picked it up to discuss it. And it's found in the longer discourses of the canon, and, and, and so the Digha Nikaya. So, uh, so it's a very, very valuable one. So to this purpose, uh, for us, we wanted to understand the foundations of the Buddhist social and political philosophy. And now here, uh, people who are not familiar, uh, of course Buddhism is considered philosophy, but in particular, I am interested in the relevance of Buddhist teaching for the society and politics. And so here, society means social institutions, uh, politics means like state and the governance and statecraft, yeah? So, uh, uh, so the basically to the th all three lectures aim to introduce some aspects of it. And, and, and here, there's value in this. You know, we want to appreciate the value and especially relevance of Buddhist scriptures for contemporary world because, uh, because mo some people think that Buddhism has less relevance to the modern world, which is not true. There are discourses and Buddha was concerned about the issues uh, at the time, like say, for example, uh, war. You know, we think today is the corrupted world and war, but the Buddhist time also there were war and violence. So, and now here, in this discourse, we will get into some of the key uh, aspects of, uh, which, which are relevant for today. And, and then, here, most important thing is, the analysis that Buddha employed in these discourses are extraordinary. And, and they are influential in shaping what we call Buddhist thought or Buddhist philosophy. And that actually requires our attention to them. And here, uh, I will give you briefly um, uh, th those three discourses that I plan to talk about in the coming, we, uh, coming two occasions. And of course, I already mentioned that they are in the Deegan Nikaya. And here, uh, issues that they concern are poverty, crime, caste discrimination. Those are the uh, key issues they deal with. Now, of course, poverty is a serious problem all over the world. Like, you know, after COVID, for example, all around the world, the people have become poor in all levels. And, and also the poverty level has gone up in various countries. But these are not new issues. Even in Buddhist time, they were common. And so uh, we will, next week, on next Sunday, we will talk about more poverty. But today we will talk about more about caste or class. 
Yeah? So that's the first discourse we call Agganya Sutta. Now here, uh, Agganya means like Genesis or the beginning. Now we have to remember something that Buddha was always says uh, the sansara has no beginning and that sansara has no end. You know, kind of, and but and oh, the world has no beginning and world has no end. So the Buddha always discouraged um, his disciples not to ask the question, not to explore it, because Buddha saw that uh, dwelling on this question about the beginning of the world is meaningless. However, here, because of a specific reason, because of the issues concerned about Brahmanism, Buddha was forced to give a little bit about the beginning. So, the, so he was not interested in the Genesis, but nevertheless uh, beginning things appear in this course. So in that respect, this discourse is very valuable. And next two weeks, we will talk about the Chakravati Siyanada Sutta and the Kutu Dantra Sutta. Now, am I too fast for you? Oh, I'm speaking too fast, no? Everybody can follow, yeah? Okay, wonderful. So now Chakravati Siyanada Sutta is a dis, uh, lion's discourse or discourse on the lion's row of wheel turning monarch. Now there, clearly, it's about the ruler or, or the person who ruled the country. So it's a kind of it's, uh, relevance for politics. And then the, the third one, Kutudanta Sutta, is very important because it talks about economic planning, you know, kind of uh, addressing social issues using a plan. Now, of course, when we think about economic planning, we think about communist governments and socialist governments. Uh, but here you could see some of the, uh, some of the, some aspects which much come closer to some of the ideologies maintained by socialist government. And also you could see some of the ideas that come up here, you see critique of capitalism also. You know, you see that it's quite interesting to take these all three as a one package and explore it, it relevance to the modern world. And, and so, uh, I would, I, you know, we should not use the word unique because it looks like a more rhetoric, but indeed this sutta is unique because it talks about the beginning you know, beginning of things. Now, this is the citation for people who wanted to uh, look up in electronically. This is a D means Diganikaya, volume three, page 77 onward. And also people who are interested in Pali, you know, I, I knew some people are very much interested in Pali. I gave some of the quotations here uh, for uh, 10 points, and you don't have to write them down, but if you're interested, in, you can use them, and I will refer to them from time to time, yeah? So, um, so now this sutta, uh, the Agganya Sutta, uh, is very important because of its critical part of it, or critical apparatus in it. And here, Buddha appears very radical, uh, very revolutionary. And also, sometimes you can see that actually Buddha is using even today what we call offensive language in some ways uh, in this discourse because he was uh, criticizing the, in the, the tra stuff came from the earlier. So, uh, so it's interesting, some of these, you know, if you read these, um, Pali, you see some of the underlying words, you know, kind of, uh, uh, see this kind of uh, sexuality related languages used, you know, kind of, uh, uh, Buddha did not use diplomatic language, he was straight to the point, you know, kind of, kind of very unusual in that way. So he did not try to cover it up or hide and use a lot of humor. You know, kind of, uh, he responded to the question with a lot of humor. He, oh, uh, shaming the opponents, you know, kind of uh, saying, you know, what you say, you say this, but actually it is this, you know, kind of like that, you know, quite, quite interesting. So that critical apparatus is a quite fascinating part. And, and also, uh, even though it's not explicit, there's a strong, unusual doctrinal content in it. Especially this one, even though it's not specified, anicca. Anicca we translate it as not permanent or impermanence. And now I think uh, this is the Buddha's unique contribution to the world. Of course, 
apart mind, understand of the mind, the distinct contribution that Buddhism makes is impermanence. You know, that things are in a constant flux. Uh, or uh, changing its shapes. And you can see it in Agganya Sutta, it's very clearly. And, and so that's, uh, so th without these concepts, probably he couldn't uh, use this critical uh, explanation in the Sutta. So the impermanence is the guiding principle uh, there. And so, broadly, even though there are other issues, but here in this as a discourse, it talks about the origin of the world, or, or myth about the origin of the world, and the formation of the state, or ruler, and kinship, and the social institution like marriage, family, and you know, things like that, you know, how, how these institution classes came into being, uh, and that these are the, this is the content. And then, from modern scientific point of view, like uh, evolution and and you know the kind of research about you know black hole theory you know you know kind of all this uh, scientific theory probably some of you are more familiar with it from that point of view also this has uh, has a merit as a scientific document you know uh, you know kind of a explanation of the uh, change in the world and also interesting uh, because we tend to criticize. Uh, Marx, Karl Marx in particular, in terms of uh, his emphasis of materiality. Uh, and you can see the Buddha also has used that argument. So people who uh, can compare with Marxism and socialism, you can also use this uh, this scripture to some extent, uh, what Buddhists uh, wanted to express. And, and in this discourse, it's very clear, materiality or the material things have a significant impact in changing the human lives, the both mind, you know, kind of. So this is also a very important contribution. So, so we tend to uh, ignore the money, economics, and the material things often but here it's very clearly the material things are the ones which change our life and change, transform social institutions. So in that way, the evolutionary development uh, uh, is there and it's very valuable insight uh, in the discourse. And, and now, why I choose this one? Not because I am interested in the caste or the class, but because of its critique of what I what I call Brahmanic hegemony. I don't know. If, I don't know whether you know this word hegemony. Like uh, uh, could say like oppressive, dominant narrative, or, or postmodernists would call it meta narrative. You know, kind of the uh, you know like evol theory of evolution is a meta narrative. Uh, and you know, Brahmanic hegemony also a meta narrative. That's the guiding principle that shaped the India, or what we call India, uh, India subcontinent. And now, in this sutta, there is a critique, serious critique, and uh, shamelessly actually, uh, you know, very strong critique of the cultural norm, and that that makes the Buddha a rebel you know, kind of revolutionary and uh, kind of refusing what he inherited as, uh, if you use the word Indian, of course the word did not exist at that time, but if you use the Indian, he looks like more anti-Indian in some ways in his analysis, uh, especially when it comes to kinship and so on. So the caste is an important key item in his uh, change, you know, challenge in this uh, hegemonic narrative that Buddha refuses, you know, very clearly. Uh, and so, very, it's less likely that we have any other scripture like this. So this is, a, in that way, it's a very special one. So now, before moving further, to give you a, a little bit flavor, I want to give you a little bit about content. How many of you have read this sutta in original, in Pali, Sinhalese, or in English? Anybody? Ah, amazing. Wow. 
So that means all are meditators. Yeah? All are meditators. And yeah, meditators, yeah. I'm sorry I should have, um, but if you need to look at them uh, for the other ones next time, you can actually Google them, you can find the text very easily. But it's good that you are not familiar with the text. That means my presentation has more value because I'm not talking something that you're familiar, yeah? So nobody has read it. Wow, this is some, I one person, okay, two people. Oh, the, the other one? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so two people have read it. Okay, wonderful. But if you have read it, you are in familiar ground, and then you may want to look at that, those slides there. But people who have not the text, it, they may not make any meaning, you know, because they, they're all technical terms. But the slides will be helpful for you, okay? Now, before moving into detail, I want to give you a brief about what the content is. And these are in, all in Pali, and I'm going to kind of, uh, uh, kind of identify them. There's a preamble, you know, it's preamble is concerning about the caste, especially Brahmin says that we are the best, you know, kind of that's, uh, I think it should be mentioned here. I think Brahma no Seto, you know, kind of the third line there. So that's the word used and that's the kind of the preamble. Uh, and then uh, these are the kind of the key first point. It's about racial or ethnic purity or purity associated with your birth. So, so basically the forecast forecast and in particular one particular caste taken as the best yeah uh, so uh, purity related with your birth and then uh, the second point uh, talks about how the world evolved and here taste rasa you know kind of the material that they eat eating uh, and and uh, the, the sweet stuff and how it changed the life and then the third part, you know, these are, we, I will go into all of this here because then it's easy for me to briefly explain them. Like say, after that you can see the sun, earth, creeper, rice. And now here what you get is, uh, at that time there was no sun and moon, sun and moon were born, and then stuff appeared on earth and the creepers and then uh, it, it disappeared and then rice came. So there's a critical period there. You know, when the rice appeared, you know, the civilization become a little bit more. And then, until then, there's no sexual distinction. There's no between male and female distinction. And so the third stage, the sexual differentiation comes. And, and then, fourth one, you know, family life, you know, sexual relations, you know, come, uh, c come into effect. And then uh, come, uh, you divide your eyes, you start uh, making boundaries, you kind of have your own plot of land. And that seems to be cre creating chaos. You know, that's where our really problems start. And that requires appointing a kin. You know, Maha, it's called Mahasammat, you know, kind of, this is where the state begins, you know. And then next section goes to, to this is where actually the focus from uh, six, seven, eight, you know, the, you know, those, uh, those three, four are the focus because that Buddha basically uh, going against the Brahmanic narrative and Buddha mentions, uh, actually Buddha define, redefine, you know, of course in the Brahmanic Vedic text these castes are defined, but Buddha kind of turned them upside down and he has a different definition of it and that definition is given. And then nine is quite one, uh, important one, Duscharita, or oh, the good and bad and vices come into effect. And then the last one, you know, kind of more awakening morals. So here, basically, uh, these numbers taken from the Buddha Jayanti Tripitak in Sri Lanka, so the numbers not do not match with the PTS one, but it doesn't matter. But basically, you can see where uh, the discourse moves, you know, kind of uh, uh, caste, and then 
a primary stage of evolution in the world, the food, and how the food changed the lives and so on. So, so he, so now I have given you, yes? Uh, the previous one or? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this one is only a brief because, uh, because it's new, I thought, is to give you an idea. And one of the key points that you want to take today, you know, from this is, Buddha defines the caste. Buddha says actually uh, how it is understood is different and it's distortion, it's not real. I am going to interpret it this way and this is the way it should be. So, so basically turning the tables down, you know, up, down, you know, kind of, uh, so complete rejecting of the, uh, the Brahmanic narrative. And so now we will go for little by little. Now here, I want to go to the context, you know, what is the context for this sutta? It is interesting, if you look at it there on the top, you will see uh, Vasetta and Bharadwaja. You know, Buddha was uh, living in Savatthi uh, and in, in, in Pubbharama. At that time, Buddha had two trainees. Two, two trainees came to the Buddha and they were undergoing probationary period. That means they were getting initial training. But they were Brahmins. Uh, two Brahmin, Vasit and uh, Bharadwaja. And when they came to Buddhism, and Buddha says, you know, you are Brahmins. You know, what, what your fellow other Brahmins tell uh, talk about you, what do they tell you to? And they, and they say that they actually abuse us. They blame us. And they say that we were the best caste, and you went down the drain, you know, you became, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you, you choose the worst caste, you know, uh, because you renounce being a Brahmin. So that's the context. Now, Buddha did not hear, at least in this context, Buddha did not want to tell about the beginning of the world, but he wanted to refuse this uh, uh, abuse. Uh, this hegemonic narrative, and that's why uh, he kind of find opportunity to give a little bit detail about the uh, about the situation. Now, it is interesting. There's a serious criticism of Brahmani belief, but the inter you know the people who uh, the the reason for that discourse are the two Brahmins themselves, you know, two Brahmins of themselves who are trying to be Buddhist monks. Yeah. So it's a very quite interesting uh, context there. Uh, so uh, so here the Buddha was staying in the Savatthi and then two Brahmin was it and saying they were you know we wanted to become bhikkhus. I mean, this is the statement that the the blame that say only a Brahmin is of the best social grade, other grades are low. So that's the uh, hegemonic, hegemonic narrative, yeah? So which is called Brahman hegemony. So this is actually, I think it is still operation in operation in India. And I think if you think about uh, the situation, after, of course after Modi, you know, probably Dalit situation got a little bit better. But, uh, and of course, uh, Ambeka, you know, in the 1950s. Of course, we know that there was always friction with Gandhi and Ambika because they did not get alone. Uh, of course, you know, people know about Ambika? Yeah, people know, yeah? Because uh, yeah, he come from the, not from the four castes, but even the lowest caste. And then the story says that he could not go to school and he sat outside the walls of the school and learn. And then he goes to Columbia University and, and, and then we got a barrister and, and I think he was in London also. He come back and he's the one who wrote the Indian constitution. And that's why Indian constitution is very much secular. And, and then he was testing all the religions. In 1956, he, with five million Dalit people, uh, he became a Buddhist. And that's the kind of modern period where, uh, because Buddhism disappeared almost from 13th century onward, uh, with 
the Mughal invasions and so on, and of course there are other reasons also. But then 20th century again, Buddhism, of course, Dalai Lama comes in 1959, and Ambika become, you know, with, with uh, you know, of course, he was experimenting with Christianity and Islam, and he thought that the best option would be Buddhism. So, so this uh, uh, Dalit, or we, they are outside the caste, they were the oppressed, and their situation got better after 1950s onward. And I think from the I think last few years with Modi, the kind of I think he has empowered these classes. I think that's that's what I heard, but I, I don't know. You know, uh, because actually this is the, this is one of the problems for India, even today, because uh, if you think about China and India, China doesn't have this obstacle like that, but this class or caste distinction is obstacle for India's development. You know, if, I think India would flourish better if they didn't have this class distinction, which is just my observation, you don't have to take it as the truth, but my observation, yeah? So, uh, so, so this is kind of saying, and then, uh, and then Buddha says, you know, that's not true. What they say is not true. What, really, what happened is these Brahmins have forgotten the, the, the real story, and Buddha start criticizing, and that's where things get, uh, uh, you know, kind of notices. And, and then, they, he, this is where he criticized very clearly. And uh, we say, on the country, Brahmanis, the female wives of Brahmins, are known to be fertile, uh, seen to be with child and so on. You can see this, I have kind of underlined Utu and on, the, on, the, on the number two, I think third line. I cannot see it well from this angle. And this is the word that Buddha used. And there, Buddha did not hide what he want to say because these are sexual language actually. So you won't say it in public. You know, sometimes we in Asian cultures a little bit in Japanese would say hasukashi. You know, kind of little bit uh, you know embarrassed to state it in public. But Buddha, you know, kind of clearly say it in uh, without any any uh, filtering. So very clearly, and this is, this is again, and what you're saying is true. I'm going to explain a little bit later on this, because I have the, the original text and I will show it to you. So now, I move into this idea of beginning. Now, uh, there are different views on the origin of the state in ancient India. Two belong to pre-Buddhist tradition, and this is one tradition is a Brahmanic tradition, other one is a Jainaman. The third one is the th early Buddhist one, no Theravada Buddhist tradition. So the earliest account in that context in Theravada is Dakanya Sutta. So now they are a powerful critique of caste or class or status. You know, all three, we can take it as something similar in any society. Now, caste can be a problem. It's a problem. It's a, it could be a serious issue for empowering or developing nations or for improving the material conditions. Like, for example, Japan developed so quickly after the World War II because they didn't have a class or caste. You know, because they were crushed to the ground, but they were able to rise up as one nation. And this may not be the same in many other countries. It would, you know, because of this uh, lack of equality. So, caste system imposed by Brahmanic hegemony can be seen as the gravest social problem of harm. And here, I use the word harm in the sense of violence. You know, here, uh, violence in the sense of denying the human rights. Like, for example, UN Charter will say that uh, any human being, any human child, if they are school in age, should be able to go to school, for example. It's a fundamental right, yeah? So, the caste may operate in a situation that you may deny that right to a human being, yeah? So, it can work as a deterrent. For, uh, for prosperity, yeah? So the kind of, the, it's not just a label status, but it has uh, harmful consequences. 
So Buddha rejected static definition of social state of human being. You know, one person is higher in at the birth, or other person is lower at the birth. Buddha rejected it. And Buddha, from the Buddha's point of view, of course, we know that Sri Lanka, for example, have adopted some sense of caste, which is quite contrary to the, the Buddha's teaching. Buddha basically, of course, it's the influence of India, I guess. But anyway, so equality is very important, irrespective of birth. And, and, and now, how Buddha protested this hegemonic narrative is his community that he introduced, Sangha. You know, Sangha means collection, you know, coming together in many groups. And they, once they become, they renounce all previous identities. You know, they are reborn as a new person, so they become casteless. So this is the one actually bothered uh, when they were accused in Vasitta and Bharadwaja. So uh, here what you, what you see is that observable data or, or empirical examples Buddha used to counter the argument. And he, he questioned the very foundation of Vedic hegemonic interpretation. He ha he his explanation was cast what was in India was a gradual development in your society on the physical and occupational factors rather than divinely ordained creation. This last two lines is important. So Buddha's interpretation highlighted gradual development of caste in Indian society. So the, it is not by birth, but because of the professions, you know, professional, de you know, that, that develop into caste and also physical and occupational factors, you know, kind of jobs that you do shape your location rather than they are divinely ordained as the text suggests. Now, in the Indian context, caste is a divine thing, so you cannot mess with it. So you cannot, like for example, if you're a Brahmin, you're not supposed to marry somebody in the Sudra class, for example. You cannot move, you know, because it's going against the God. So, uh, so this forecast, this text is important, you know, if you're not familiar, with Indian context, you may want to read it, but I got some excerpts from, for you here in this slide. Call, this is very important. This is a creation story in the Indian tradition, Hymn of Man, and in Sanskrit called Purusha Sukta. It's come from one of the oldest forms of Indian literature, Rig Veda, the most sacred literature. And this story found, found on the creation of the world. And these some of the even though it's not strictly uh, or directly related to the topic, but I thought it's, we should, because it's the background uh, that Buddha was opposing, and so it's better to understand what the Indian situation was. Now, this is this creationist story, say, thousand heads has Purusa. Purusa is actually, literally means man. A thousand eyes, a thousand feet, on every side fervid in earth, he fills a space ten fingers wide. This Purusa is all that yet hath been and all that is to be. That means that's the reality. What was in the past is Purusa, what will become in the future is also Purusa. Yeah? And all creatures are one fourth of him, one fourth. And three fourths are eternal life in heaven. So it's like uh, only a tiny bit in this world. You can see some resemblance to incarnation in the Christianity, also reincarnated, you know, like you know, something similar there. Yeah? So it's quite interesting. With three-fourths Purusa went up, one-fourth of him again was here. And from him Vraj was born, again Purusa from Vraj was born. As soon as he was born, he spread eastward and westward over the earth. When goats prepared the sacrifice with Purusa as the offering, its oil was spring, and the holy gift was autumn, and the summer was wood. So kind of, uh, uh, if people are not familiar, with the Indian Hindu tradition, sacrifice is the most crucial one. Uh, that, uh, you know, sacrifice uh, is the one that, one, the essential way of pleasing the gods, yeah? And now you can see even the sacrifice, Buddha changed it. You know, what we call dana, 
or feed in the monk is the option that would uh, convert it, change it, you know, rather than sacrifice it, you know, uh, support the monks and monastic community. I'm not, no time to go into it, but this is how he twisted it. From that great general sacrifice, the dripping fat was gathered up. He formed the creature of the air and animals both wild and tame. From it were horses born, from it all cattle, goats and sheep were born. When they divided Purusa, how many portions did they make? This is the important point, 11, yeah? What do they call his mouth, his arms? What do they call his thighs and feet? And then the answer comes. The Brahmin was his mouth. So that means the, from Purusa's mouth, Brahmin was born. Uh, and from his both arms, the Rajanya made. Here Rajanya refers to kin, but basically warriors, Sastriyas. And this is the caste that Buddha himself belonged. Yeah? Buddha himself was belonged to Rajanya because he was a warrior, the ruler. Yeah? So he was basically born in his armed forces. Yeah? And his thighs became the Vaishya. Vaishya is usually the word for traders, yeah, merchant class. And from his feet, the Sudra was produced. Now, Sudra, we call it sometimes untouchable. Yeah? So this is one, and, and, we, and it was an occupational term, people who sweep the streets and scavengers and deal with dead bodies and things like that. Those professions, they were called because, see this kind of uh, mapping according to the uh, parts of the body. And the higher you are in the body, you're superior. So because, uh, and also this kind of symbolism is interesting. Brahmin as the mouth of Purusha, the reason is their role. The Brahmins has a role to recite text, the, 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 recite the sacred text, because they are basically, I mean, you can hear even the next temple, you know, I just heard the Vedic recitation in the few hours ago. And so, the, because they use the mouth for recite the text, and perhaps that may be the reason, perhaps uh, the mouth was associated, but this, this hierarchical allocation would uh, criticize very much. Uh, and so this, this kind of the, the background that Buddha was opposing, yeah? And then there are other stories here, you know, kind of the moon was gen, you know, gen from his mind and so on. I'm not going to do this because that, because we are limited time, but you got the point. The, the, the sacred scripture assigns where these four races come. Yeah? They were created. You know, they, were, they were divinely created roles. Now, Buddha's critique, Buddha rejected traditional caste discrimination in India. He highlighted gradual differentiation. This is a very important word. Gradual differentiation of people. So the people were formed into various classes, so, so on, you know, kind of as a result of economic factors, as a result of material factors, and not because of they were created. So they were equal to one another in earlier time, yeah? So kind of basically with the saying, it's like just a myth. What they're saying is a myth or a story, make up invented story rather than the real. So the Aganya's critique, the four classes that I'm uh, not going to go in detail, but these are the ones that we mentioned already. Yeah? And if you are, want to know more, you can go to this section, you know, four classes. Uh, this is the Muller's translation, Sacred Books of the East. Yeah? And, and, and now, uh, this part, uh, I will skip it because, uh, I mean, there is an important point, but because we are running out of time, uh, we may not say, but this word, both bad and good qualities, you know, this emphasis is very important because today the, the, the part of the talk is about morals. So this is the, the good distinction of good and bad serves as the key part of this discourse. You know, the Buddha says as the important part of it. Actually, uh, your class depends on how much good you have in your life and how much bad you have in your life. So the more bad you are, you are lower, more good you have is higher. That's how the Buddhism weighs it down. Uh, so, and now this is also interesting here, uh, that in virtue of a norm, 
and not irrespective of norm. So here, what norm is translated Dhamma. In this translation, norm is used Dhamma. So Dhamma as the criteria. So the good behavior, good understanding as the key. Yeah, maybe I will skip this, but this is a kind of the discussion that uh, uh, say that even a kin, Pashenadi, was actually the Buddha's kin, uh, kingdom, Kapilavata belonged to him. But, so Buddha is supposed to pay homage to him. But nevertheless, kin Pashenadi always come and pay respect to the Buddha. And this is where actually the, uh, the, the respect of the monks comes to. Like for example, today in countries like Sri Lanka and Thailand, even the royalty will venerate the monks. You know, uh, you know of course it, it has Asokas also, the same idea. Because the idea is that, you know, uh, they have a norm, they, they have a higher way of life, you know, they are, uh, their lives are led by the Dhamma. Because of that, you know, the, the kin bow down, you know, that's one of the arguments that Buddha makes there. But we are not going to go into detail. Uh, and then, this is the answer that he tells the Vasit and Varajwa, this, this is what you said, I am a veritable son of the exalted one. Exalted one means the Buddha. Born from his mouth, born from the norm. Here, norm means Dhamma. Born of the Dhamma, created by the norm, created by the Dhamma, hair of norm. And so basically say, it's the same wording that Brahmins used earlier, twisted and transformed and say it actually you know, I am a son of the Buddha and I have gone beyond it, yeah? So it's a very interesting one. So here, so far what I have done, I say that in the, using the Purusa Sukta, there was a kind of social hierarchy introduced in India on the basis of birth. Uh, and, and, and that birth is created as a divine creation and Buddha was protesting to it, Buddha was saying, refusing it, yeah? So from the Buddha's point of view, everybody is equal. And what they, if they differ, they differ according to good and bad they have, and, and Dhamma in their lives, yeah? So that's so it's a spiritual criteria from the Buddhist point of view. You know, kind of conduct is very important. Your day-to-day -day running of your life is more important than your parents or where you were born, yeah? So it's very, very similar to the way the Americans think today. Oh, you know, kind of like that, you know. No matter where you come from, as long as you can make money, you are great, yeah? So, so now, the origin, uh, you know, the or, origin here, Buddha presented not to just talk about origin, but to explain the, the Brahmins are fools, you know. Brahmins are inventing things. You know, Brahmins are not speaking the truth. They have forgotten the real thing. You know, that's what that. And then he goes back and, uh, you know, kind of going to like a recorder, you know, kind of rewind them back and play back. You know, kind of that's what's happening. Uh, and then it's a long story. And, and it say that there comes a time after lapse of a long, long period, this world passes away. So that means what he means. I think I put it there. Uh, basically, here the idea is nothing remains permanent. The environment changes, the human beings change, and uh, as a result, you know, the world moves. And this is the impermanence. When this happens, beings have mostly been reborn in the world of radiance, and there they dwell, made of mind, feeding on rapture, self-luminous. When sooner or later this world begins to revolve, revolve, beings who had deceased from the world of radiance usually come to life as humans. So um, I wonder when the population increase today in the world, people always ask, you know, are the mosquitoes reborn as human beings? You know, kind of like the people ask the question. But there seems to be a little bit answer here. At least here it seems that people from the, uh, the heavenly realm are 
be born in in the human world. So here, uh, I think sh I should have mentioned it's about Abbasara, uh, self uh, radiant. So the the original place, they had a radiant body, they were happy, and they were mind was clear. They were enjoying and they had a very carefree life. And then they are the beings, they were able to travel in the air, you know, Riddhi, you know, like seers. And so they came to this earth and inhabited. So that's the kind of the explanation he's trying to say. But it's a very, very early stage and it moves to next next stage. Now this is interesting, the gender was not there. And now at that time, all had become one world of water. Now these are uh, quite interesting to compare. I'm not saying that they are exactly similar or exactly the same thing, uh, say with the science, you know, black hole theories and other scientific theories, but they definitely may have help for, uh, you know, uh, scientists. Uh, in the, in the some some in the some if you are some, uh, if you're a scientist you may want to consider it like you know kind of origin of this universe you know basically say become one world of water dark and darkness of that makes blind no moon no sun appeared no stars were seen no constellation neither night manifest no days like you know no distinction neither months no half months neither years no seasons. Most importantly, no sexual distinction, no male or female. Uh, you know, the beings were reckoned just as beings only, so the, uh, the, the, the distinctions are less. And those beings, sooner or later, after a long time, Earth with its Savior was spread out in the water. So the, these, now here, Earth Savior, you know, kind of the uh, sweet stuff on the Earth, this is the kind of transformative material, you know, kind of once they started eating these, all the other things start appearing. So this is kind of the thing that can I say that Marx's idea of materiality comes very close to here, kind of material things as important, you know, kind of where that's what's happening here. So, and then, uh, of course, this is also related to Marx, but Buddhism says the greed. You know, greed disposition is a key element uh, with material things and the greed disposition. So the, the material things working with the mind, that's the kind of the, uh, make this change. Some being of greedy disposition said, look, what, what will this be? And tasted the savory earth with his finger. He thus tasting became suffused with savour and craving entered into him. So, greed, craving. And think about Buddhism. These are the three poisons, yeah? The greed, hate, you know, kind of hatred, yeah, and things like that. So here, you know, the kind of four noble truths, you will say craving, trusna, yeah? And that, so here you see these negative qualities are associated with this origin of the things. And uh, it goes in the Buddhist explanation. And then he says this, uh, the doing there of the self luminance of those being faded away. When they start eating, the body become ugly and changed. Yeah? And then say that they even later on say that their self luminance faded away when it happened, the moon and the sun manifested day and become and the world evolve again of course million millions years and then it says that um, also says that they be, their bodies become solid and and then the the fifth line say you know some were uh, some were handsome others were a little bit not handsome but then the handsome ones were conceited and, and they despise in others and things like that. So here you see our mana or conceit or pride or taking, comparing with other, taken as a problem and, and the cause of the evolution. Are you with me? Any question to ask? Yeah, Bhante. Thank you for your thoughts. Yeah. It is really interesting to listen to you talking about caste, evolutions, 
and the origins of the uh, universe. Uh, but I find that uh, in the study of Buddhism, it's only problematic if you try to diverge from learning morality or spirituality and try to diverge into things like cosmology or things that like even uh, rebirth or karma, which is very hard to uh, see from a scientific point of view. I think, uh, the Buddha also mentioned it, I think, from the Kalama Sutta. I don't, don't, don't believe in everything that people say or, or from the scriptures and all that. So, uh, from this Sutta, I think the Buddha tried to talk about the origin of the universe. But I think we try to jump into it too much. And one day I think we find it is uh, against the uh, evidence of the, sci the science the proof that become problematic. Yeah. I think that's what I have to say. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And actually, uh, here the Buddha is trying to say that this Brahman narrative, what they say in is wrong and is false. It's a construction and it has no basis. And basically saying actually they have forgotten the real facts. So that's what Buddha is trying to say. So that's actually very strong criticism. You know, very strong criticism say, you, you know, you're making up stories. You know, that, that's what it is. So I'm trying to get around it. So Buddha did not plan here to give the origin of the world, but he gives this narrative to explain to those two guys, Vasit and so on, you know, you know, actually the, this is what, how it happened in the hi historical terms, in millions of billions of years, the world, uh, you, know, trans, you know, transformed. And as a result, these classes came into being, you know, or vocations came into being. Yeah? Okay. Yes, please. No, I think as you were saying, which I understood from the beginning, is you're trying to do a kind of a textual exegesis. Yeah. Today, one text and two more texts to follow. So I think in that context, it was most appropriate to provide a context for this text, not just historical context, but also an ideological context. Yeah. In fact, there were two fundamentally different views the Hindu and the Buddhist, and can also include the Jainas, and, and which was a historical controversy that went on for almost over a thousand, thousands of years. Yeah. And so, without knowing that, we can't understand the, the, the text itself. So I think when one listens to a talk like that, one needs to get into the framework of that text and pose questions which are within the logic of that text and the logic of that you know, the context. Otherwise, we risk, uh, you know, giving a counter discourse based on our own preferences and prejudices. And no, I'm not criticizing you, I'm just yeah, yeah, saying yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that's basically, you know, what I wanted to say. It's not that there are not no other points of view, but then one should go elsewhere and listen to those points of view. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So the, uh, the, uh, this story, uh, what is interesting is that Buddha usually talks nice things, you know. Buddha usually doesn't say even I mean, the worst, worst word that he uses is idiot. You know, that's, 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 the, that's the word he will use it and he will not say anything beyond that. Now, but the language that he uses like Yoni, Utu and so on, is quite I think it quite can be considered as vulgar yes. uh, and offensive, but also saying actually your mouth is something else, you know, kind of like the, because the, so they are with the use in a lot of humor, kind of almost to the extent of embarrassing yes. and the locutors, you know. So that's what I want to get in this textual analysis and say uh, there's a layer of, uh, you can see the Buddha in a different way also in the text, you know, kind of, uh, you know, he, he, the way he's characterized in the text is different from other characterization, the language used and also his observation of empirical factors, you know. So that's, that's the beauty of it. And then also we have this, uh, 
a notion of the how the world began and how uh, the material, see like say, Karl Marx is a very influential thinker, whether we like it or not. And, uh, and, and Marxism uh, ha is still contributed in and scholarship all about Marxism and materiality is the one that we privilege today. And now you see here very clearly the Buddha seeing the materiality as a key factor that transform the individuals and the institutions. And that's what fascinates me. And, and now there is also the beauty of it, the Marx will think about only the, you know, workers and the factories and the production line and, and the proletariat and so on. Uh, he will think about it, but he don't think about the mental factors. You know, you know it is there, overconsumption and so on, but he doesn't mention But here the Buddha clearly identifies you know, it's not only the material things that uh, change our life, but also our disposition, the, like the greed, you know, craving. And, and we, I did not go into later, you know, of course of the time then, but maybe next week I will catch up. But then there, clearly it says that uh, when, the, when the, there were rice there, and you can, you go and pick them up and they grow naturally. But then a lazy fellow think, you know, why should I go in the morning and the afternoon to collect twice? And why don't I go once and collect one, once? It's like almost like we do. We go to grocery store and bring stuff for the whole week and then pull the freezer and the fridge and everything, yeah? It's like we do. And then one, you know, it increases one person went for two meals and two days, and then it increases to eight days. You know, one fellow goes and get the rice for eight days, and then the rice also change. You know, rice early it was clean rice, and it they, they naturally grows, and then they have husk, and they lumped and so on. And then when you eat them, your body become darker and your luminous qualities disappear and so on. So here what you see is that not only the material things change the human uh, body, but also the human thinking or, or, or ideas about it also impact. So when, when you have acquisitive qualities like storage, the nature itself punished. I mean, look at them. I mean, of course, you don't have to take it, but climate change is a good example. You know, uh, you know climate change, you know, earlier, maybe 30, 40 years, we, uh, you know, probably did not even believe it. But now you see pouring rain, you know, remember, I think it's Dubai or uh, Abu Dubai, I think, you know, kind of remember the, the rain, you know, kind of flooded the airplane, and the airport and so on. I mean, these things you never, heard, you know, had encountered in the same tsunami a few years ago, the earthquake and so on. So, so here what you see is this fascinating to see the Buddha is not talking about nirvana or liberation, but Buddhism talking about uh, how the family come into me, sociologists in interested in talking about family, the units and so on. Here, there is a full exploration of, uh, you know, idea of personal property, you know, idea of injustice, you know, how do you resolve and so on. So, so the, I think apart from the criticism of the hegemonic narrative, there's a beautiful ideas here. And also, uh, this could be a discourse point with materialists today because most of the scholars in the Western Academy are Marxist, you know, uh, and also the scientists also, Max, you know, Marxist in some ways because of material impact. But thing is that this is mental, you know, our psychology, how our psychology impact the material thing, they have not thinking, but these texts, Buddhist text talks about not only the importance of materiality, but how our psychology has impact on the materiality. So this kind of mutual influence is the one which give birth to new things. Does it make many sense? Yeah? Okay, and should I continue a few, 10 more minutes? Yeah, also I have... Yeah. 
Yeah, it is better. Names of these two um, disciples to whom he is preaching, uh, it's very um, significant because so Bharadwaja is a very high caste Brahmin. And Vasistha, I would guess it means Vasishta. So these are where the royal chaplain Purohitsas used to come from, that caste. So they are the two monks, I mean the two would-be monks or disciples, they are coming from the highest Brahmin caste. Yeah. So also the whole context you gave. So but what is interesting is like from what you said at the beginning, it seems that this whole question of the abolition of caste yeah. is very much with their joining the Sangha. Yeah. That is to say, within the Sangha, there is no caste. Yeah. You should, know? yeah, shouldn't be. But then there is another issue here. Then this is a relation. I mean, the talk here is on the sociology and politics. So there is life in the world, life in society, and life out of society. So in a sense, the Sangha is out of this world. I mean, people yeah. who have renounced, right? Yeah. People who have renounced, they are out of the world. Uh, they are forming their own society based on monastic vows. So there, there is this, this ideal of equality, something that is very livable. But what about within society itself, the caste has persevered. Yeah. And if you look at, um, at the, so this is, let's suppose, at the early beginnings of Buddhism and the Buddha is preaching, or just after that. Now, if you look at towards the end of the Buddhist period, after the 12th century, if you go to Nepal, so caste is very strong among the Buddhist community there. There are Buddhist Brahmins there, yeah. uh, Vajracharyas. Yes. There are Buddhist Brahmins. Uh, they play the same role as the Brahmins play for the Hindu community. And in fact, they also um, serve the Hindu community as well. And so these were former monasteries. They started getting married and then the caste comes in again through the back door, as it were. So there is a problem of a kind of ideology and institutions within the world, uh, which was always caste in the sense of in the Indian context. Yeah and then outside the world. Because even if you look at the Hindu, Hindu side, the sannyasi, like the monk on the Buddhist side, is supposed to be casteless. Once you become a sannyasi, you are dead to the world. You perform your funerary rites as if you are a dead man. And then there, uh, you, there's no question of caste, whether you, have, you, you originally a Brahmin or whatever. So uh, it's obviously there are parallels. And on both the Buddhist and Hindu side, they are struggling with the same yeah. kind of a yeah. social issue, I, I yes. guess. Yes. One coming from one ideology, one coming from the yeah. other ideology. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the observation. Very valuable. And uh, the caste actually is a problem for Buddhist society too. Uh, because Buddhist society has not been able to go away from it. And in some circles still it plays a significant role, which is unhealthy. Uh, and actually one of the, I mean, I made a comment about India. It can be made same for Buddhist societies too. Uh, like uh, the, the development or enhance in the welfare could be speeded up more if there's no caste distinction. Uh, you know, uh, so this persecution on the basis of which family you belong to is uh, detrimental to improving the human conditions, even in Buddhist society. So, uh, so it's a kind of devastating fact. Yeah. And this, um, you may be interested in reading the last two pages of this text. And it points out the same point that you are mentioning. It says that basically, uh, it defines the Brahmin. Who is the Brahmin? Uh, and then it says that, you know, the Brahmin, there were some Brahmins who went, who, who went to outside and live in the forest in its straw houses and they start meditating. And like the Buddhist monks, they will come to society during the daytime to collect alms. And then they, uh, they go back and they're called Jayanti. That means they are, they are making dhyana meditators. And then uh, then there is other group that you know who were living like that, they did not want to meditate and they came to the city and the villages and they were concerned about the text and started uh, reciting texts. So there's kind of another 
Brahmin group, Ajayak, like reciters, Vedic reciters and so on. And then there's another explanation, say that any caste, you know, the kind of, the, you have a role, like say, if you are Brahmin, you are reciter, and if you are Sastriya, you are warrior, and if you are Vaishya, you are merchant, and if you are Sudra, you are cleaner. But any of these people can renounce their duty. They can, they can stop doing what they are supposed to do, and then they become castless. So, like becoming a Buddhist ascetic. So the, so the Buddha basically says there is the four caste here, but then there is a fifth one, they are ascetics. Ascetics who, uh, who are coming from all four previous castes, but they renounce it. They don't feel, feel like, like Arjuna, for example, you know, in Bhagavad Gita. You know, he's a warrior. He has no choice. He has to do it, yeah? But then Arjuna could have, say, oh, I'm not going to do this. It's a dharma, you know, I'm not going to kill. He could have done it, but he didn't. You know, things like that. You know, quite interesting. Uh, more you read this text, there's a kind of... Uh, fascinating ideas about well, who the Brahmin is and, and who, who are the meditators are and who are the Vedic reciters and then uh, we did not go into detail about the appointment of kin and so on uh, but there's a fascinating text maybe uh, uh, if you have time just to google it and read it and come back and we will if it's possible we will try to catch up yeah and because we went to a uh, nine 25, maybe we can close now, no? What do you think? Yeah? So, uh, so basically, just kind of few words I will summarize so far what I did. Uh, basically, the importance of this discourse is Buddha appears like a rebel in this text. You know, he is humorous, he is empirical, and he uses observable evidence to challenge the his counterparts, you know, the, the hegemonic narrative, and then he provides a, a redefinition of the Brahmanic uh, narrative. And most important for us, I think, as scholars and uh, people who inquire, is, is Buddha's ideas of the beginning of the world, social institution, and, and transformation, and their materiality seen as the found foundation of and now the materiality changed human institution and social institution, but in particular, like as, as you see this conceited, you know, kind of as you can see in this slide on the fifth line, these are the, these are the ones that pride, you know, things like that are seen as the elements which kind of speed up things. You know, kind of, because earlier we were radiant and luminous and happy and so on. Gradually we came down because of these negative qualities. That's what is the kind of world. So the so the people who are just studying materialism and uh, you know, kind of uh, Marxist view of things that what matters is production and the material economic success, and that they are they are just talking about only the material things, but where the Buddha says, actually, yes, they are important, they do things, but they are working in interaction with the humans. You know, human interaction with these material things actually change the human lives. So that's the kind of the, uh, the foundational thing that we can learn in this text, yeah? So, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Leslie Jayawardena, here they are, who is the secretary of Sasana Vivartan Society for inviting me on this occasion. But also we should thank to Mr. Sirisena, who is the uh, president and also other committee members who are here. And also our venerable monk, uh, venerable Datuk uh, Ki Dhamma who are supporting us and facilitating us. And also the venerable monks in the temple and everybody here, the diakas, the supporters. And without you, it's not possible to have 30 people here. Yeah, we, they have put a lot of sweat, you know, to get this thing in. So uh, with this merit, uh, we wish that it will help us to think clearly or differently on the Buddhist text and read 
make a make a, a determination to read this text and try to understand it and uh, less uh, this reflection on them may help us to uh, to bring happiness to our lives and to improve ourselves and to improve our critical abilities and also to study text uh, neutral way as much as possible, unbiased way, and understand them for uh, for our spiritual journey. With that thought, we will conclude, uh, and we will transfer our marriage to relatives. Uh, and may they, are, if they are in a disadvantaged situation, may they accept our merit and make their lives uh, better. Yeah, okay. Akasatachabumata de Banaga Mahindika Punyantang Anumuditwa Chiran Rakan to Locus Asanang Akasatachabumata de Banaga Mahindika Punyantang Anumuditwa Chiran Rakan to Locus Asanang Aka sata chabumata diva naga mahidika Punyantang anamoditva Chiran rakkan tuluk sasanang Sabbiti o viva jantu Sabbaru go vinasutu Mati bavat vantarayu Suki di gayuko Abhivadana siris nichang vadha pachayino Chattaro dhamma vadanti Ayuvannu sukhaṁ balaṁ Ayurāro kya sampatti Sagh sampatti me vichu Atho nipana sampatti Iminati samijyatu Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu